everybody. Uh, welcome to this week's Asia Research Story. Um, I'm Renee Jeffrey, Professor of International Relations in the Griffith Asia Institute at Griffith University. Uh, and it's my pleasure to be hosting um, another great Asia Research Story. Uh, before I do, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners um, of the various lands on which we're meeting, watching and participating in this event today. Um, for me, that's the Jagera and Turrbal people. Um, I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to the traditional owners of all the other lands um, from which people are participating um, in this seminar today um, or watching it um, in the future. For those joining us live via Zoom, um, welcome. Um, if it's your first time joining us, um, it's a, an especially uh, warm welcome. I'm really glad that um, you're able to join us this week. Um, as always, we will have a short Q&A um, at the end of the session. So please submit any questions that you have um, via the chat function. Um, and don't feel like you need to wait till the end of the conversation. It's always nice to have a few questions ready to go um, at the end. Um, if you could keep your cameras and microphones um, off for the duration, um, that would be great. Uh, we would love to be able to see all of your faces um, and hear your voices in the Q&A, um, but unfortunately that makes the editing um, a little bit difficult. And of course, lastly, we'll be um, back over on Twitter um, later in the day with our hashtag uh, researching Asia stories uh, to continue on the conversation um, and later to be posting the podcast link. So for those who are listening um, to that podcast, uh, I hope you um, enjoy the conversation and that you can join us at some point in the future. So I'm thrilled to introduce uh, today's guest, um, Dr. Catherine Grant. Uh, Kathy is a senior lecturer in music literature and research at the Queensland Conservatorium at Griffith University. She has a Bachelor of Arts from UQ, a Bachelor of Music with honours from Griffith and a PhD um, for which she was awarded the Chancellor's Medal also from Griffith. Um, her work focuses in the areas of ethnomusicology, um, intangible cultural heritage, music sustainability, music education, and music and social justice. Uh, she's particularly well known for her work on the sustainability um, of music practices. Um, she's the author of Music Endangerment, How Language Maintenance Can Help, published with um, Oxford University Press in 2014, and the co-author of Sustainable Futures for Music Cultures, um, also with OUP. Uh, Kathy was awarded an Endeavour Research Fellowship in 2015, uh, a British Museum grant in 2019, and the Australian Future Justice Medal in 2015 for her research advocacy and activism on cultural sustainability. So welcome, Kathy. Thanks so much, Renee. It's a pleasure to be here. So look, one of the things that I've really loved about this series um, is hearing about all the different life paths and career paths, all the journeys that people have have been on, um, you know, to get to where they are today, you know, having a conversation about their research. Um, and what's been one of the lovely things about doing this out of the Griffith Asia Institute is that we've got people from a huge range of disciplines. Um, you know, we've had people that started off in journalism, in politics, in history, in health sciences. Um, so I'm really, really, um, really excited to talk to you today. Um, from the perspective of music um, and talk to you about how you've come to be doing the research that you do on music and social justice um, and so on. So I guess, you know, there's those typical sort of background questions on you know, how is it that you came to be doing that combination of work sort of in music, but on social justice and language um, and so on. Sure. Thanks, Renee. <laughs> I think, um, as with some of your um, your previous guests, I never expected to end up where I am now. Mm. Um, so, yeah, let me tell you the story. I also, before I begin, I wanted to um, to pay my respects to to um, the Indigenous custodians of uh, the land where I am, which is also the Jagger and Turrbal people, um, and to extend uh, that respect to Elders past, present and emerging, and to all Indigenous people here in Australia and uh, and indeed in Cambodia. Um, and around the world. Um, so how did I get, a, how did I end up where I am? In my, um, in my childhood, there was always music in the home. Um, both my parents are, are musicians. It was predominantly Western classical music. Um, mm -hmm. I've always had an interest in uh, other peoples and other cultures though. And um, I had the opportunity in my late teens and early twenties to travel 
and during that time I, um, I trained as a teacher of English as a second language so this is a, a, a oh. first, a, my first profession if you like. Mm -hmm. <laughs> For some years I taught um, English in Europe uh, and later uh, trained teachers of ESL uh, back in Australia so I guess it was actually during those days that I began to um, really develop my, my interest in and love of other, other languages and other cultures and also other musical um, traditions. So it was um, about 15 years ago now that I decided that I did want to return to the world of music and um, I had the opportunity at that stage to become involved with a project funded by the Australia Research Council uh, and led by the um, Queensland Conservatorium Research Centre called Sustainable Futures for Music Cultures. So this was an a international five-year project that was looking at these issues of um, the strength and the sustainability, but also the endangerment and the loss of, uh, of um, certain musical practices around the world, particularly those of um, minority or, or minoritized uh, peoples. Um, yep. uh, this was also in the context of um, uh, UNESCO um, in the previous three or four years before the commencement of this project, um, having released their convention on the urgent safeguarding of intangible cultural heritage, which was mm. really directing the, um, directing the, the attention of um, ethnomusicologists or music researchers um, to these issues of, um, of the, the strength and sustainability of musical traditions. And so in my work on that project, I guess I started to reflect on the fact that um, there were the, the, on the similarities between endangered musical traditions and endangered languages, which I'd known a lot about um, through my, my work as a, as, a, as a language teacher mm. uh, for some years. And it struck me that linguists had been working with communities to keep their languages strong for 20 or 30 years, since the early 1990s, really, that's been a, a field of um, sociolinguistic um, study and, and effort and attention. And so my PhD uh, then, which I decided to, to undertake on this topic, was looking at those similarities, I guess, or the, um, the, the learnings that we might be able to take from the field of sociolinguistics or endangered languages and language maintenance and reflecting on how those might um, be, uh, be applied or be useful um, or uh, modified. Um, mm -hmm. or um, policy makers and governments and nonprofit organizations and um, researchers to help communities to keep their, their musical uh, traditions strong as well. Wow. So, yeah, look, I mean, a wonderful story about, you know, bringing together sort of two sort of seemingly separate areas. And we've heard that story so many times in Asia stories about, you know, people's, you know, past experiences sort of academic and life experiences you know coming together to to produce something really new and really you know insightful and important um and so on so after you did your phd um what inspired you to you know enter the world of academia and for that to be sort of you know the next step for you mm. the phd that's right it was a, it was certainly a stepping stone so what happened after there uh, after um, completing my PhD, which was 2012, um, actually relates to my involvement with Asia as well. So, both oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so um, soon after I completed my PhD, I wanted to learn more about a particular organisation in Cambodia that I had learned about during the course of it, and that is Cambodian Living Arts, which I know yeah. you, an organisation you know well as well. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I guess I was interested in their work because um, they have had, um, in, in my, to my understanding, considerable success in helping to revitalise and promote um, some of the many um, traditional performing arts uh, genres that were at risk um, of, uh, of, of disappearing. So this is in the context, of course, of... Um, the aftermath of the genocide, the Khmer Rouge genocide of the of the seventies in Cambodia, um, and and its aftermath, the, the years of um, of civil war and political unrest and uh, and famine and so on, hardship um, in the eighties and even into the nineties. So it was uh, in the late nineteen nineties or early two thousands that Cambodian Living Arts was set up to support um, the revitalisation of. Um, 
at that time, particularly the traditional uh, performing arts. The estimate is that around nine in 10 uh, musicians lost their lives during the Khmer Rouge genocide of 75 to 79. Um, and about half of all musical traditions, it's estimated, uh, also um, disappeared during that time. So I was particularly interested to learn more then about, um, uh, about their, their, their efforts and their approach. And I went over there uh, and was uh, very lucky to be invited uh, while I was there to participate um, in, or to work with them, to collaborate with CLA on a project, a research project um, on a topic of interest to them at the time, which was what are the barriers to young people um, engaging in traditional um, music and other performing mm. Um, and what are some of the incentives? And the same for the older, the master musicians, uh, or those who had learnt their art before the Khmer Rouge era. Um, what were some of the barriers to them passing on their, uh, their knowledge and skills to young people? And what were some of the incentives? And I guess it came up um, again and again during the 18 months or so that we were undertaking that project and having conversations with younger, younger learners and, um, and older master musicians that the possibility of earning an income was a major incentive um, mm -hmm. to engaging with these traditions, but also that socioeconomic circumstance uh, in many cases was also a barrier um, to the involvement of, um, of, of both uh, young and old. So for example, young people uh, would sometimes feel uncomfortable at spending the many hours that it takes to become proficient on a musical instrument instead of helping out uh, with um, matters of livelihood around the home, for example, working in the rice paddies after they come home from school or um, getting a job if they're um, perhaps studying at university in, uh, in Phnom Penh. Uh, to support their family back in the uh, back in the provinces. That's just one example um, mm. of uh, the stories that we were we were we were told then. And so, of course, um, CLA Cambodian Living Arts was interested to find ways around that. Yeah. Um, to explore that more deeply. And this comes to your question about academia. I was then um, lucky enough to secure the um, the Australia Endeavour Fellowship to work with. Cambodian Living Arts on a project that specifically looked at the socioeconomic circumstances of young people uh, and how that either um, encouraged or inhibited um, engagement with the, uh, the traditional um, performing arts. Mm. And so that involved spending quite a bit of time um, in Cambodia, didn't it? It did. That was in, uh, in 2015. I had six months there, a little over six months. Um, which was a, a wonderful experience and, of course, an opportunity for me to, uh, to engage more deeply than I had been able to on my previous two or three trips there. And I think it was also during that time that, um, uh, that I began to think more about the effect of um, poverty on um, music sustainability, but also cultural sustainability more, more broadly. And it mm. was then that I began... I began to be a little bit uncomfortable with the way that um, we music researchers, or I don't like to use the term ethnomusicologists, but that, that's the discipline that I'm in. There are problems with the word, but yeah. um, <laughs> there, there were problems with the way that we often talked about um, cultural endangerment in terms of quite... Uh, quite innocuous things, things like um, globalization or urbanization or the rise of digital technologies. These are things that uh, in some senses are of course very beneficial for um, a flourishing of, of, of cultures um, mm -hmm. and cultural practices and certainly they um, they present some challenges to them as well. But um, there's no one to blame for globalization or, <laughs> or urbanization or digital technologies. These are kind of global shifts. Um, and even if we could, even if we wanted to stop them, whether or not it's possible to stop them um, is another question. In, yeah. in those six months in Cambodia, though, I started to reflect more and more on the fact that there are actually, there are social injustices and inequalities and power imbalances, global power imbalances and inequities, as well as local ones that are actually really giving rise to some of these circumstances of cultural endangerment and loss. And I didn't feel as though we talked about that um, enough within, within our, our scholarly discipline, that, um, that it was these injustices and inequalities that was actually 
driving mm. people, leading people to, to not have the means or the free choice around which cultural practices they engage with and, and how they do that. That's, of course, as true of um, Australia and many other countries around the world as it is um, as it is Cambodia. But that was when I really began to think more about um, about how we frame these matters of, um, of, of cultural loss and endangerment. And that it's mm. important to recognise that um, in some cases there, there really is agency there. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that really leads really nicely to something else that you know, you've been you know, thinking more, more broadly and something that we've um, been in, in common workshops um, on, you know, talking about the relationship between the performing arts and social justice and, and human rights, um, particularly in Cambodia, because there's quite, um, you know, there's quite an important um, story there about the role that the arts has played and is playing um, in in addressing um, injustices and, and looking to the future. Um, and that certainly is something that, um, that the title of your um, seminar today sort of you know, references, I guess, this idea of you know, enchantment and, and re-enchanting something. So, yeah, so that's become, become part of what, you know, part, part of your research story as well, I guess. It's sure, yeah. Um, that's right, that in, in one sense, it's easy for, for us, for me, uh, to think about this relationship between injustices and um, depletion of cultural strength or the loss of traditions. But of course, the opposite is true as well, that mm. moving, moving towards um, social justice can also um, have wonderful outcomes for the flourishing of cultural practices as well. So when people across the whole of society are enabled and empowered um, to participate in the cultural lives of their communities, then that leads to a better social life and um, a, a better society with any lack. Um, mm. So yeah, this idea of re-enchantment, um, this comes from the, the cultural sociologist, John Klammer, um, who argues that it's through the performing arts that we can, um, in some ways, we can best transcend current limits, social and economic and uh, political limits. And the way that we do that through the arts is by disrupting old stories and by generating new ones. And mm. I think in Cambodia, the creative arts are certainly um, offering many ways of, of of doing just that, of disrupting the old stories and telling new ones. And um, we've talked That's a really, about... Yeah, really good examples of that, aren't there? Um, so, I mean, one of them that I, I think is wonderful is The Courageous Turtle, um, which, yeah, I mean, what, what tell, to tell everybody else, um, we're, we're having the conversation about it and know what we're talking about, but what, what's the whole story behind The Courageous Turtle? Because I think it's a really lovely one. Sure. It yeah. Is. yeah, we've talked about this in other um, in other yeah. forums. Yeah, there are many many examples. I had the great fortune of um, of seeing a performance of the courageous turtle um, in one of my recent visits. So this mm. is a theatre piece for school aged children, uh, and essentially it's to it, it travels to um, to to schools around the country, and the idea is to educate young people about the um, the, the the genocide. That's the context, the setting. Uh, for the theatre piece, but um, the theme of the work is really about civil courage. So it's about mm. having the confidence and the courage to stand up in the face of um, injustices and, and abuses of, of human rights. It's about, um, it's about fairness. And I think, mm. um, although, as I say, the setting is the, um, the genocide of the 70s, those themes of, of that, the theme of having civil courage and of, of fairness and justice is just as pertinent in um, contemporary Cambodia and just as important, I feel, to teach uh, young people, school children, uh, about as it, as it has ever been. Um, mm. And also, of course, it, it holds... It holds relevance for all of us, uh, civil courage, uh, and we've seen some um, amazing examples of that uh, in recent years with the Me Too movement, for example, or more recently Black Lives Matter. That, um, yeah, in in certain global circumstances where we need civil courage, yeah, um, the courageous turtle is a is a lovely example of how that message can be promoted um, gently, uh, non non confrontationally. Um, yeah children and, and to others and as you say there are many many other examples 
Yeah. And I think it's a lovely, I mean, it's a lovely way of allowing children to explore those sorts of ideas and what they might mean um, and so on. And last I heard tens of thousands um, have, of children had participated in it. So it's, you know, it's, it's a lovely story. Um, another great one, I think, um, is the work that's been done by um, Sofaline Shapiro through her dance company. And that's sort of, some of that work is in this broader frame of sort of broad social justice, um, restorative justice, but some of it is much more direct, isn't it, about dealing with very particular harms through the arts. Yes, that's true. The um, this uh, so Sufferlin Shapiro has a has the ensemble, the Sufferlin Arts Ensemble, I think it's called. And mm, it's been through a few different names, I think, making it tricky for us all. <laughs> okay, um, but essentially, it's or one thing that this that this ensemble does is um, uses both classical, can they classical and contemporary dance as a as a pathway to personal but also social healing. Mm. Um, uh, and not only in the aftermath of the de genocide, but uh, any injustices that are faced. Uh, and there are several, of course, as you know, mm. in contemporary Cambodia as well. Um, and I know that um, Sofaline Shapiro, who leads the, the company, has also worked closely with um, the composer Him Sophie um, and his, uh, they mm. um, together uh, um, have collaborated on the work. Uh, Requiem uh, for Cambodia, which was premiered in Melbourne, um, I think it was a couple of years ago now, yeah. which again addresses the trauma of the genocide and acts as a as a form of um, of restorative justice um, in a way. So uh, many impressive um, examples, and of course there are also those are those are bigger picture and formal um, or, or formalised initiatives, but there are many really grassroots. Um, initiatives mm. as well. I'm thinking here of the New Cambodian Artists, which is simply yeah. that there's a, um, a group of four women, four young women who have um, just come together in Siem Reap in the north of the country uh, to form again a dance troupe. They're, they're aged between 18 and 25 and they're also exploring Khmer classical dance in contemporary ways. So they're pushing artistic boundaries in doing so. Um, mm. But also in a country where um, gender disparity and gender-based violence are, are rife, this this group of four young women, just by doing what they're doing, they're they're advocating and they're embodying um, female empowerment. So these these boundaries that they're pushing are not only artistic; they're also um, social and political as well. Um, yeah, just doing some amazing things through their work. Yeah, wonderful. Um, so to go back to some of the earlier things we were talking about, in the course of some of these projects, you've actually learnt to um, play um, a traditional Cambodian instrument, haven't you? How did that come about? Yeah, um, I've had the great privilege uh, and the great joy. Um, so back on my Endeavour Australia uh, Fellowship in 2015, I was working um, not only with Cambodian Living Arts on that project, um, about socioeconomic circumstances of youth and relationship with um, traditional performing arts, but also with the Ministry of Culture and Fine Arts um, on preparation of the nomination file to inscribe this particular musical instrument called Chape mm. on UNESCO's list of intangible cultural heritage in need of urgent safeguarding. So this is a this is a process that um, that the the government in collaboration with the community of artists were keen to get underway. Um, inscription on this list draws international attention um, to the to the plight uh, of this um, this uh, the um, the instruments or the um, the traditions that are inscribed upon it. Mm. For the chape, so this is a it's a it's a beautiful instrument. It's a big lute, if you like. Uh, mm. So two, two stringed um, plucked instrument and players improvise um, lyrics uh, as, they, as they play. Um, and through those lyrics, often uh, they can be about um, educating the listeners about um, uh, Buddhist principles, but they can also provide social commentary Mm. Um, anyway, so working because I was working in close collaboration with a particular group of um, young people there who are becoming the new custodians essentially of um, of, uh, of this instrument. They call themselves the, the community of living Japan. 
um, and they're the group that are really uh, spearheading the revitalization of this, um, this endangered tradition in Cambodia. I guess because I was, um, I, I must have demonstrated my genuine interest in the instrument and I was lucky enough to be invited to learn the instrument and eventually to, um, to play and perform with them. And it's always one of the greatest pleasures that I have when I go back to Cambodia is to, um, to meet my friends in that group and to make some music together and, uh, and often to, to perform. Um, and actually it was in collaboration with um, both that group, the Community of Living to Pay, but also one of our QCA, of Queensland College of Art staff yep. members, um, Heather Faulkner, who's a photographer, that mm. we, um, we did a project um, a couple of years ago to put together an artist book that profiled uh, the members of, um, of this group and profiled the, the instrument as well. Mm. Um, so, Yeah, very cool. Very cool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and so more recently, um, you've been working on a on a project documenting um, another uh, Cambodian instrument, but this one um, through the British Museum. Um, so how did how did how did that project um, come about? <laughs> so many interesting things. It seemed yeah, interested to know how how you ended up doing that project. Yeah, sure. Um, Again, this was um, a, a result of uh, just a discussion um, with Cambodian Living Arts. So mm. I had seen that the British Museum had a new um, grant scheme running, which was called uh, a new program called the Endangered Material Knowledge Program. Mm. Uh, so rather than intangible cultural heritage, this was focusing on the tangible, uh, for yep. example, a musical instrument rather than the music as such. Mm. But I just mentioned this program to, um, to my collaborators at Cambodian Living Arts and they were keen to pursue um, uh, an application and they suggested that uh, this instrument called the Ankoich, um, mm. which is a small, um, a very small instrument. Some of, um, some of our, the listeners <laughs> might know this as the juice harp. It's a type of juice harp. So you just you, um, hold it between your, your teeth and pluck it and your mouth acts as a, as a resonator. So there are a couple of forms of this instrument, um, a bamboo and an iron form, and both of them are relatively um, unknown, the iron one mm. in particular. And um, my collaborators at Cambodian Living Arts felt as though um, there was some urgency to documenting the process of making um, these, these instruments. Um, and so we were successful in the funding application and um, in January, uh, only just before uh, the world changed, yeah. um, to go over there, and um, and we worked with three three makers of this instrument uh, from across three villages in Siem Reap province. Um, and the iron the iron Ankui maker, uh, a man in his late seventies called Ben Song, he hadn't made. He's the only known um, maker of uh, the iron form of this instrument wow. throughout, the, throughout the country. We haven't, he didn't know of any others and um, neither does Cambodian Living Arts. And he hadn't made an instrument in over 50 years until we asked him to make, uh, to make one for this project. And since then, I'm happy, thrilled to say that he's made, um, he's made further instruments and that there's been some, some interest um, from um, the younger members of his family, his children, grandchildren, and others in, in the village, um, given the project and the project outcomes, and um, even the fact of us being there and taking an interest in, um, in this instrument, that um, that's our greatest hope, I guess, that the younger mm. generation will find inspiration um, to learn, um, learn how to make and play uh, the instrument and then pass on this knowledge for, for future generations. Wow, that's yeah, fantastic. Um, look, before I sort of go to the the last sort of question I have, if anybody has any um, questions, um, now's the time um, to put them up um, so we can um, have a bit more of a conversation um, towards the end. So I guess, yeah, the last thing is what's next? Um, so many fascinating projects and yes, everything's very uncertain at the moment, but sort of putting that aside, um, what, what's next for your research in Cambodia? Mm, sure, thanks. Um, the, the immediate thing is to bring, um, bring the project to, uh, to completion, the, the, mm. project, the British Museum project. So we're soon to launch a, a video documentary 
um, from that project, which we're very excited about. A 20 minute um, bilingual documentary um, will be out, we hope, uh, within about a month. And also a little um, booklet, a bilingual booklet that profiles um, the makers and, and players who participated in our project. And we're planning at this stage, COVID permitting, we're planning a launch event in um, Siem Reap, uh, no doubt in my absence, unfortunately. Um, mm. but I would, I'm, I'm excited already at the thought of bringing together um, those who participated in our project, the makers and players, but also their families and other people from the village, um, together with um, the invitees from the Ministry of Culture and Fine Arts and UNESCO, <laughs> and so on, um, yeah. to, really, to really celebrate, um, to celebrate the knowledge and the skills um, of the, the participants in our project and to thank them um, for, for sharing that with us. Um, and hopefully also to get, uh, to get again, younger people having a bit of a try of the instrument and hopefully spark, if it spark, um, spark a longer term engagement <laughs> of mm. them, um, with, uh, with this tradition. So that's on the Cambodia front. In general, my research, I think I'm keen to explore further um, theoretically, but also across contexts, this relationship between um, issues of social justice and human rights and um, the, the strength and future of, um, of musical traditions, which are, of course, um, fully dependent on the life circumstances of the people who, who make them. Yeah, absolutely. Well, look, a wonderful set of outcomes um, for the sort of current project and really, really looking forward to um, seeing what you do next. Um, so just having a look at the chat, um, there's a comment here from Rachel saying, um, Banks of Coal was shown in Cambodia last year. I know, I went, it was amazing. It was, I don't ever seen a video before, but actually being there in the room is so different. Um, yes, it was incredible. Um, so yes, part, it was shown as part of the Arts for Peace Festival and so moving and um, I can add to that an endorsement that if you, any of you have the opportunity to see it, um, at some point if they decide to do it again then take up the opportunity because it is absolutely fantastic and just fascinating i went i went two days in a row so i had to watch it and then i had to watch it while thinking about it um, for <laughs> the second time um so bridey um thanks so much for your uh, terrific um, conversation. Um, Kathy, you've used the term flourishing a number of times, and I wonder if you could speak more about how you define and frame um, that concept. Yeah, it's really interesting. It is a word that we use a lot in this context. Yeah, yeah. thanks, Brody. Thanks, Renee. Um, yeah, a flourishing, uh, flourishing culture or flourishing, um, flourishing cultural practices. I guess for me, this comes down so flourishing happens at the social level, I, I think, um, or within the context of a society. But of course, um, the vibrancy of arts practices within a society it comes down to the choice of an individual. So I guess I see a, um, a vibrant or successful um, arts culture within a, within a society as being directly a function of the uh, of those life circumstances of individuals and their ability um, in all sorts of ways, economic, abil uh, um, economic ability, also practical um, ability as, uh, as we're experiencing during uh, lockdown, for example, um, to engage with musical practices. So um, in social terms though, if I were to pin down what flourishing means, I would say that it means that those people who um, wish to participate in cultural practices, and participate means many things, from actually doing it to engaging in other ways, being a consumer, if we, uh, <laughs> if we want to use that language, um, mm. or, or uh, of course, the participatory um, art forms, that, it, that anybody who wishes to do that is given every opportunity to do that. And that, of course, takes into account um, the necessity of equal access to the arts. So I'm thinking, for example, um, let's say women or people with disability or people um, whose language is not the, the, the first language of the community with, uh, in which they live, mm. um, but all of those people are enabled and empowered 
to engage on an equal footing um, with the, the, the ex with expressions of culture, with the, the cultural practices of their community. That would be, I guess, how I would think of a, a flourishing um, a flourishing culture within a society. Okay. Um, so Caitlin um, has just written um, excellent discussion. So many synergies between um, yeah your work this week and Nico's discussion last week, and lots and actually touches on lots of things we talked about with with lots of people. It's really lovely with sort of this community of people that have so many sort of overlapping. Um, interests and so on um, and she writes so important to understand the place of cultural practice in our interactions with the world so it's just a comment and a thank you um, which i can um, also reiterate and i'm sure everybody um, watching today um, will iterate will reiterate um, yeah our thanks to you for coming and um, talking to us today um, really really fascinating um, conversation and as i said um, earlier i'm really looking forward to um, seeing and hearing uh, what you do next um, with this. So thank you very much for today. Thanks, Renee. Thanks. Thanks, for having me. Thanks everyone. Great.